Somewhere The sponsors for this week's Kiddush is Fred and Joni Lavelle. This is in honor of Fred's 80th birthday. Happy birthday, Fred. It's also David and Fariba Magarafte sponsoring Kiddush. Thank you to them. And Ron and Sandra Stackler. This is in honor of the yard site of Ron's daughter. And the should have an aliyah. She should go higher and higher in the heavenly worlds. Thank you all for sponsoring Kiddush to Shabbos. Shabbos comes in an hour earlier this week uh, because of the changing of the clock. We'll be davening this evening at 4.45. We'll be davening tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We look forward for those uh, that are joining, that will be joining with us. The portion of Vayera. And in this portion, we have the birth of Isaac, this miracle birth, the birth of this child to Abraham and to Sarah. And then the portion, as it fast forwards through 37 years of Isaac's life, we get to the conclusion of this week's portion, where our forefather Abraham was called upon by God to travel to the land of Moriah and to climb to the top of a mountain. And there, as you all, have, I'm sure, remember this story, to offer his beloved son Isaac, this miracle child, to offer him as a sacrifice. So he wasn't really this infant that some of the pictures of the binding of Isaac have it. He's 37 years old at the time. And God comes to Abraham and tells him that this is the challenge. I'd like you to bring your son Isaac and bring him as an offering to me as a sacrifice. Now, I'm sure you all know the end of the story. There's no suspense here that in the end, an angel stays Abraham's hand. We find that it was all a test. It was a test of Abraham's faith. It was a test of his commitment. In fact, it was the 10th and final test, a test for all the ages. Now, over the years, I'm sure many of you have heard various different insights and commentaries regarding this perplexing episode, because it's a very puzzling story. Why would God do this to Abraham? Why wouldn't Abraham protest when he hears such an instruction? He protests when God says that he's going to wipe out Sodom. Abraham comes to their defense. And here, when it comes to bring your son as an offering, there's no protest. He gets up early in the morning to go. So we've, we've discussed this in great length. I've been given classes on it. I've given lectures on it and sermons on it. Today, I'd like to focus on a, a very, very simple but noteworthy aspect of the story. Not the philosophy of it, not to understand the role of it, but simply one of the backdrop parts of it. Because every time the Torah will go ahead and tell us a story and it gives us some specifics, there's a reason for those specifics. It's not just a by, by coincidence. When God says, I want you to go to this and this place, and I want you to climb the mountain, then there, the, the mountain itself is playing a role in the story. There's a reason why he needs to climb a mountain. Because if it's just about the challenge of faith, then he can tell him to go to flatland. Why does he have to climb the mountain? in order to perform this particular act, this test of faith. Well, for one thing we can say that when we talk about climbing of a mountain, you know it's not going to be an easy journey. When you walk on flat surfaces, it comes naturally. But when you go on a steep incline, it takes effort, it takes resolve. So perhaps the story is setting us up for us to understand this is not going to be easy. This is going to be a difficult challenge for Abraham, as it obviously is. For another, a mountaintop has a connotation of solitude. When you think about being on top of a mountain, you think usually about being alone. You're removed, you're isolated from the rest of society. You're out there and you're up there on your own. So when Abraham did what he did, he was very much alone. He was alone in every possible way. He was alone in his thoughts. He was alone in his action. He was alone in his faith. He was alone in his commitment to God. He didn't send out any press releases to advertise this great act of piety that he was about to commit because no one would have understood what it is that he was involved in doing. 
Who amongst his contemporaries will, would have applauded him for doing this? No, no one. Who would admire the depth of his commitment and the power of the sacrifice? No one. Who, who would cheer him on? Nobody. He was all alone. And understand, in Abraham's mind, if he was actually going to bring his son as an offering, that would literally mean that he would be all alone for a very long time. Who would want to be one of his students? Who would want to be one of his followers? If that's what he could do to his own only son, what would happen to all of the fan club that began following Abraham? So he was alone, and he was understanding that he would remain alone, the top of a mountain. Abraham met God alone on the top of a mountain. Echot Hayavram. Abraham was alone. He was one. He was his own man. And yet, humanity, civilization as we know it, exists today because of what he brought to the world, because of this man's vision, because of his sacrifice, because he had the faith and he had the courage to meet God alone at the top of a mountain. The story of Abraham, as all the stories, as I've been teaching on Monday evenings of the book of Genesis, is not just the story about an individual. The image of our great-grandfather making that climb up the mountain is my story, it's your story, it's our grandparents' story, it's the Jewish story. The story of the Akedah, of the binding of Isaac, not only applauds what Abraham did atop that mountain 3,700 years ago, but applauds each and every single one of us throughout Jewish history who meet God alone on the top of a mountain. Those who step up with the courage of our convictions, ready to make sacrifices in our lives. And when I say sacrifices, I mean whether big or small. Even when nobody out there will be singing our praises or patting us on the back for doing what we do. To meet God alone on the top of a mountain. So when it comes to Jewish practice, and you haven't been brought up with tradition, and you begin to discover at some point in your life what it's all about, and suddenly you're considering going kosher, and you start checking the products in the supermarket to see if it has an OU or an OK or if it says some other kosher symbol, and you try to figure out this business about keeping separate dishes. You have to have the dairy dishes and the meat dishes, and you keep them separate, and separate dishwashers, and, and you start really getting into it in your friends or your coworkers, and especially some of your family members, they think you've gone off the deep end, but you're at peace with yourself because you've met God alone on the top of your mountain. When, when suddenly your weekend takes on a whole new meaning because you've introduced your family to the beauty of Shabbat, and you start checking your watch on Friday afternoon to make sure you know, what time is candle lighting today. I got to make sure to light candles on time today. And after candle lighting, you refrain from certain activities. Now, you may not be going the whole nine yards yet. You may not be totally Shabbos observant yet, but you're going along step by step and your neighbors wonder what's gotten into you. And they think it's some passing fad, some impulse, but you're meeting God alone on the top of a mountain. That's your Akedah. That's your binding of Isaac. Or you schedule time during the week to attend Torah classes or now Zoom classes. Or you wake up in the morning and you put on the tefillin before taking on the day. Or you make sure to put mezuzahs at your doorpost. And most of the people are questioning your actions. It's between you and God. God sees what you're doing. God knows what you're doing. And God celebrates that sacrifice because God is waiting there for you at the top of the mountain. Each and every single one of us, we have our own mountains to climb. We have our own challenges to meet. We have our own individual tests to withstand. And they're not the same person to person. We each have our own set of challenges. I remember hearing about this young woman who 
headed up a major business in New York City. And she began attending Torah classes and studying about Jewish practices and Jewish observances. And over time, she decided it was time. It was time to start making some changes in her life. So one day she called the rabbi and she said, I've made up my mind. It's time I start keeping kosher. So please come over to the house and make the kitchen kosher. He says, no problem. He comes over that night. He has this blowtorch with him. He has this handbook. And they start going through everything it's going to take to make that kitchen kosher. And as the rabbi is talking to her, he notices that on the counter, there's a pack of chiclets gum. I don't know if they still have chiclets gum. But in those days, there was something called chiclets gum. And there's these little squares of gum. And he says, by the way, once you go kosher, I don't believe that chiclets is kosher. So you're going to have to do away with this brand of gum and you're going to have to find a, a kosher brand of gum. And the woman looks at the rabbi as if the whole world just came crashing down on her. Give up my chiclets gum? I'm going to have to give up this gum? I can't do it. I can't go ahead with it. I can't do it. I can't live without my chiclets. That's too much. That's too much. I thought I can handle this, but I can't. I can't do that. I think this has all been a mistake. It's premature. Now, eventually she calmed down. And eventually he introduced her to many other gums that are out there that perhaps taste just as good, if not better. And she was able to go ahead and kosher the home and go through the process and get used to a new bubble gum. But at that moment, the chiclets gum loomed large because it was something she was accustomed to. It was something she was used to. It was something she enjoyed. It was something she thought she needed and she couldn't give it up. Now, when I tell this story, I don't tell it to mock her or belittle her. On the contrary, that simple story is something every single one of us go through. We may not be able to relate to it because we don't think gum is that important. But then again, someone may not think that that which is important to us is important to them. We each have our chiclets gum challenge. Those one, two, or three things that we cling to that we can't let go of. And it's exactly there where we have to pass our own particular test, whatever that might be. And that's where we turn that key and we unlock, unlock this gate to truly finding the strength within us to climb the mountain, our own mountain, our binding of Isaac. And this is true, by the way, in all aspects of life, not just when it comes to the ritual, not just when it comes to the spiritual. We each have our own hurdles, our own challenges. And sometimes it really feels like an uphill battle, like we're climbing Lady Face Mountain and it's hard and I don't know when I'm going to get to that top. Like we're walking up the steps of an escalator. And you say an escalator is not so bad. An escalator helps you go. No, I'm talking about when you're walking up the steps of the escalator, but you're going the other way, which means the escalator is coming down and you're trying to walk up. So every time you walk up a step, you're only making up a little bit, a little bit of height because the escalator keeps coming down at you. You know those days, those days where everything seems to be this uphill struggle because you're climbing your mountain. There are setbacks in life. There are disappointments in life. Not every time that we try to do something good and right will we succeed. Not every time do we think it's supposed to go according to this plan. Life is supposed to go exactly the way I think it's going to go. Sometimes that initial attempt doesn't work. And we fall, and we fail, and we falter. And sometimes it hurts, and sometimes we're confused, and sometimes we just don't understand. What I have found about God is that God is predictable. He's predictable to be unpredictable. You can always rely on God to be unpredictable. Just when you think you have him figured out, he surprises you. That we can predict, that God will always be unpredictable. And so we think we have it all figured out, and it doesn't work out the way we want it. And it disturbs us, 
emotionally and mentally and at times physically. You know, those that go mountain or rock, rock climbing will tell you that not every step results in going higher. Sometimes they slip down a notch. Sometimes they realize they need to go down two notches in order to go up higher. But a minor setback, it's part of the process. Life is not a straight line. And it's not a well-paved road. It's a mountain. Judaism's view of a righteous person is not necessarily one that doesn't falter now and then. A righteous person is the one who falls again and again. But he continues to get up each time and continues to climb. Doesn't quit climbing the mountain. So whether your particular mountain is in the arena of your career, business-related matters, relationships, family, friends, instead of allowing setbacks to send you hurling down the mountain, learn from the experience, use it as a springboard to catapult you to greater heights up your mountain. There's a rather, a rather strange, famous biblical story about Jacob. We'll get to it in a few weeks. Jacob is returning to his homeland after being away for many years. And he's alone at night. And the Torah tells us this mysterious stranger attacks him. And they have a wrestling match. The Torah describes a wrestling match between Jacob and this mystery man. And the assailant expects Jacob to be an easy victim. But Jacob refuses to surrender. He won't give up. And the Torah says they wrestled until the break of dawn, all through the night. Jacob knew he needed to defend himself, and he fought a brave and valiant fight. When the assailant sees that he cannot overpower Jacob, he strikes him on the hip and dislocates his hip. And despite the pain, Jacob won't surrender. He won't let go. And the attacker grows desperate and appeals to Jacob to release him. And Jacob then understands that he's no ordinary opponent, but rather a heavenly emissary. It turns out it was the guardian angel of his brother, Esau. So Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the angel there will bless him and says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Yisrael, Israel. Because you struggled, you wrestled with the divine and with man, and you prevailed. So what does our very name Yisrael, what does Israel mean? What does it mean to be a part of Yisrael, a part of the Jewish people? What does it mean to be a Jew? The Torah tells us in the first time the word is used. It means that even when you're all alone, even when it's a struggle, even when you're wrestling with the divine, you still hang in there. You persevere, you do the right thing, and you turn the suffering into a blessing. That's the story of the history of the Jew. You get up on your feet and you climb the mountain. That's why the mountain plays such a pivotal role in this story of the binding of Isaac, of Abraham being alone, climbing that mountain with his son, with Isaac. Back in the 1960s, there was a young Jewish man living in Mexico. His name was Solomon Mizrahi. And Solomon struggled desperately to eke out a living to support his family. And he established a a business importing coffee, which he would sell in and around Mexico. And it was a very tough, competitive business. And he kept hitting brick walls. And one day Solomon negotiated a deal with a Japanese supplier to buy a huge amount of coffee at an incredible low price. It was a long-term contract, and it was a very, very good deal. This was it. This was the break that Solomon was waiting for. His profit margin would be so big that he would have enough for his family to live comfortably for the foreseeable future. He would generate enough money to invest back into the business and grow it to a whole new level. That night, he proudly showed the coffee contract to his wife. They were ecstatic. They danced the night away. That contract represented a new future. They can go out and look to buy a house. Poverty days were over for them. The next day, the Japanese supplier shows up at Solomon's office looking very somber. 
And he said to him, Mr. Mizrahi, the price I quoted you was too low. It was a mistake. Nevertheless, as an agent for my company, I signed on that contract. And if you hold me to that contract, which is certainly your right, my company will honor it. But as a consequence, I am sure I will be fired. If that's what you decide to do, I wouldn't blame you one bit. But my career will be over. Now imagine yourself in that position. Business is business. A deal is a deal. A contract is a contract. This was about a whole new life for the Mizrahi family, all riding on this contract. Solomon Mizrahi picked up the contract and he ripped it to shreds without batting an eyelash because he wasn't going to move up by stepping on someone else's back. At that very moment, Solomon Mizrahi met God alone at the top of the mountain. He experienced his binding of Isaac. And his lawyer and his business associates must have told him he was crazy. But God had nachas. God was proud. And just like that, the big dream was over. Solomon Mizrahi continued to struggle, trying to generate whatever business he could. No windfall opportunities came along, but he never looked back with regret. A few years later, that same Japanese man left the coffee company and moved on to become an executive for a big electronics company in Japan. The company which had developed cutting edge technology in its television department decided to market their television sets in Mexico. And they were looking to give exclusive rights to distribute the new product in Mexico. And without missing a beat, our Japanese friend pipes in and says, Mexico, I know a businessman in Mexico who is impeccably honest. And Solomon Mizrahi was granted the exclusive rights and any retail store in Mexico that wished to sell these popular television sets can only buy them from him. It was a gold mine, far more lucrative than the old coffee deal ever would have been. And from there, Solomon Mizrahi's reputation grew when he went on to become the exclusive distributor in Mexico for many major companies, such as Yamaha Pianos and Citizen Watches and others, and eventually became a very wealthy and charity-giving man, supporting many Jewish organizations and worthy causes all over the world. It began with him meeting God alone on the top of the mountain. And I'll conclude with one more beautiful story. It may sound like something out of the dark ages, but it took place actually in 2007. And it takes place in Baku, Azerbaijan. In Baku, there was a Jewish woman who married a non-Jew who was loosely affiliated with the Russian Orthodox Church. He was never a practicing or active member of the church, so that when the woman told him that she wanted to enroll their nine-year-old daughter in the local Chabad day school, that's right, we have a Chabad day school in Azerbaijan. It's called Or Or Avner. He said, fine. It didn't matter much to him because he wasn't really religious. As time went on, however, the man began to notice things. The child would come home all animated, excited about her Jewish studies. Her eyes would light up whenever she spoke about the holidays and about praying and about Torah and about the Torah portion of the week. And every Friday night she would recite these blessings before lighting the Shabbat candle. There was this joy, there was this radiance about her. And all day long, all she would talk about is her Jewish practice and her Jewish studies. And it started to bother him because, hey, I'm not part of this religion. So one day he says to his wife, listen, if our daughter is going to be going and doing all these Jewish things, then I want, I want something from my side too. I want her to be baptized by my religion. If she can be baptized by my religion, she can continue going to your school. Mother and daughter were not happy about this. But the father then gets stubborn and he drew the line in the sand. Either she gets baptized, if not, pull her out of the school, no faith, no religion at all. So the mother had no choice but to acquiesce. And sure enough, the man makes an appointment for the following Friday afternoon with the priest of a church in a small Russian town. And during the meeting, the priest asked the girl if she indeed wanted to become a Christian. And was she prepared to take into our heart everything she's supposed to take into our heart? And she was an honest girl. She says, no, I'm a Jew. 
At which point her father gave her this stern look when sent a warning that you better cut this out and go along with this program or you're not going back to that Jewish school. And so she cooperated and she kept silent. And then they had the pronouncement of the prayers and she was dunked in the water. And you can see there was this sadness all about her. And as the priest started going through all the various rituals, the little girl began playing the holiday songs that she had learned at the Chabad school in her mind. Her, her mental singing was interrupted when the priest gave her an instruction and said, now as a sign of your acceptance of the church, I need you to go to that table. You see the candles there. I need you to light a candle. This brave, confused, nine-year-old child looks up at the clock. She walks over to the table. She covers her eyes. And with everything she had inside her, she cries out, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedishanu B'Mitzvosa B'Tzivanu Lahadlik Ner Shel Shabbos Kodesh. She made the blessings over Shabbos candles in Azerbaijan in a church. I'm sure she didn't get any applause from anyone in that room. But on that Friday night, in a Russian Orthodox church, this nine-year-old girl met God alone on the top of a mountain. And so when we read in this week's portion about Abraham walking up that mountain, understand that we're also reading the story of this young girl in Azerbaijan. Understand that we're reading the story about Jacob wrestling with an angel. Understand that we're reading the story of Solomon Mizrahi tearing up a contract. Understand that we're reading the story about a, a woman in Manhattan giving up her chiclets gum. Understand that we're reading the story of you, your story, with no one applauding or admiring your efforts that you make sacrifices big and small, sacrifices for Judaism, sacrifices for your family, sacrifices for your friends, sacrifices for total strangers, and sacrifices for God. Because you climb your mountain and you meet God alone on the top of the mountain. You know, we often speak about the importance of community, of joining with a congregation, of worshiping as a group, and it's a very, very integral part of Judaism. It's a paramount part of the importance of Jewish life. But I also think that every once in a while, it's a good idea to have some solitude to spend some quiet time without the phones, without the computers, and without the televisions, without the news media, without social media, and with even, even without people around you. Pretend there's no one else in the world at the moment, just you and God. Nobody to impress, nobody to imitate, no one to appease, no politically correct or incorrect positions, just you and God. And then think deeply about your inner truths, your beliefs, your fears. Think about your particular and personal challenges, about your mountain, because we each have that unique mountain that we're climbing. And we've each been given the strength to climb that unique mountain. The strength is there. The strength is within you. You need to make the move. You need to start to climb. And maybe you won't meet, reach the peak right away because maybe it looks invincible and maybe you're afraid of heights. So have a conversation with God and speak to him using real words and sounds and share your sorrows, share your grievances, share your hurt, your disappointment, but allow the room for healing and for reconciliation and then get on that mountain and climb. Let's learn from Abraham. Let's climb our mountain. Have a good Shabbos, everybody.